Um, <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Ridwin McGuire. Uh, Ridwin is currently a statistician working in the healthcare system, working with large and rapidly changing data sets and presenting and communicating these to non-statisticians. Ridwin is passionate about open source technology that makes science easier and gets meaningful results into scientists' and policymakers' hands. And Ridwin's talk is called Open Information, Documenting Data and Methods. Welcome, Ridwin. Thanks. Um, that's coming through okay? Excellent. So yeah, I am a diff bit different from the people we heard from this morning in that instead of being someone who's primarily trying to use open data or get data to be made open by other people, I'm a producer of open data. As I said, I, worked in, I work in the health sector, although I'm just speaking for myself today, and we deal with getting data out into researchers' hands, into journalists' hands, into students' hands. We publish online. We're looking to get it to everyone who wants it. But this means we've got some challenges that aren't really obvious and aren't thought about in a lot of the way that people think about research data traditionally. And so I wanted to talk a bit about a concept which I've come to call usable data, which is a subset of open data. I want to say open data as in legally open data, data that's got good creative commons or similar licensing behind it. That's a necessary step, but it's not the sole thing because you need to have data which is usable, data which you can actually pick up, take, understand, and work with. Is your data really open? Is it accessible to your core users? Who are your core users? We're going to talk about that. Um, do they know what to do with it? And really important for doing good science, do they know what not to do with it? Can you help your users avoid newbie errors? Um, so, as I said, I work with scientific data, so that's the focus of this talk. And scientific data, it's often really complex data. Um, we can have correlated or biased problems in um, scientific instruments. But we can also do a lot of stuff to adjust our data before sending it out. Or we might send it out raw and know that those adjustments need to be made. In either of those ways, you need to communicate that. Um, I used to work in environmental and air quality data. And we had this great thing. We used to measure wind speed. And you get this graph that goes along and then has these sharp peaks every now and again. The wind sped up a whole lot. This was caused by birds flying past. Birds fly past at much greater than wind speed and cause these peaks. Now, there's a number of ways to take these peaks out and none of them are perfect, but you need to use one of them. If you give your users the raw data, you need to tell them that they need to do something like this. You need to link to a paper because unless you're, you shouldn't assume that your users know as much about the area as you do. If you want to make your um, science accessible for a whole range of people, you need to be able to bring them along that journey. And that means dealing with the real world messiness. If you clean that data, you might be cutting down the real um, level of variation. You might, as well as taking out those birds going past, you might be taking out a couple of things which were actually real wind gusts. They need to know about that. They need to adjust for that if they're um, going to further model on this. Um, I work in health data, which means a lot of crunching beforehand. If you're going to do that, you need to do things like 
um, demographically adjusting data. So age adjustment is a thing that we do as an absolute standard because it means you can compare a disease rate across two communities where that disease mostly happens in either young people or old people and you can um, have a measurement of, say, which local government area is doing worse in that disease and not have that just come down to which community has more old people in it. But if you're doing that, your users probably want to know, and so this is where we get into documentation. So this concept of usable data, we want data which we want to release open data which provides for reproducible science. Your, if you're releasing data, you need to think about releasing data with all the information people need to know to redo the science that you've done so that they can use it in their own area, in their own work. But they need to get the right results. We need to not be garbage in, garbage out. And that means talking about how the data was collected, why the data was collected, whether adjustments were made to it. When we talk about UX, absolutely fundamental component is you are not your users. You need to get out there and think about the users who aren't like you. You need to talk to them. And you need to recognize that you're a bad model for your users. Can I get a hands up? Who knows what a um, nephrology unit is? Excellent. We've got about three people. So nephrology is the worst sign. Well, it's not the worst sign you can have in a hospital. It's a very bad sign to have in a hospital because your nephrologists know where they work, probably. Your um, patients with much less understanding, much less subtlety of medicine, know that they need to see their kidney doctor. So you need to put up a sign that says kidneys, not nephrology. And similarly, in open data, you need to be telling people when you're talking about scientific data, when you're talking about complex data, this is about kidneys or this is about whatever it's about in the simplest possible way that gets your meaning across. Who remembers BuzzFeed? Don't do Buzz, don't do Google Buzz. BuzzFeed is fine. I am, uh, don't do Google Buzz. Um, tested with 20,000 people, all Google employees. Google employees are really odd as a group. Um, their high income, their high education. They know a lot about the internet and are very comfortable with technology. When you set up in-house tests, you limit yourself because you're not reaching the people who actually need to know what you're releasing. So we can look at personas. Um, this is a thing that we use personally. Um, who knows what personas are? How much am I? About half the room. Great. We make up little characters, little stereotypes or short stories about who our users might be. And we think about which features work for them and don't. And we get out of the mind frame of, this is what I know, so it's fine. Um, this, this works for me, so it's fine. We need to step away from that. I did a, I did a big piece of work earlier. It was on um, writing up a lot of our statistical methods that we use at work. So we're trying to do plain language descriptions of what we do. One of them was for age adjustment, um, I mentioned previously. When I wrote this, I had, um, I, I had a draft, I'd done it up, I, I went to Twitter, I was chatting to my friends, I just said, look, can I get 
some points on what you want to know about age adjustment because I'm doing this thing and I want to check that I've covered all the bases. I didn't expect the answers I got back. What is age adjustment? Why do I care? What is this method? Way more basic than I'd considered. And, and the people I'm talking to on Twitter, they're researchers, they're very health literate, they know what they're doing. But in this area, they didn't. I'd completely overestimated the knowledge of my user base. Um, so we ended up going back and completely rewriting it, just sort of stripping it down and saying, this is what age adjustment is. This is why you care. And you need to be able to put yourself into the mind of that beginning user. And it's really hard because age adjustment has been a part of almost everything I've done for the last five years. You just can't do medical data without it. And so the basic question becomes so invisible to you. You might have high school students accessing your data. Lots of time, lots of enthusiasm, but probably really low level of knowledge about the specific thing that you're working on. You might have journalists. Um, I get queries from journalists reasonably regularly, and they're great. They tend to have really broad knowledge bands, but they're really busy. You need to, when you're communicating about the data that they want to use, they need to know what they need to know now, and they don't need to know the 17 pieces of background. I work with statistical researchers who want extremely detailed questions about my methods and my techniques and the reasons behind them. In some ways, these guys are easy, easy for me because they tend to read my languages and so I can send them code, which is great. I can just say, we did it like this. But you need to make sure if you're dealing with sort of professionals in the field that you're getting all the data. And we work with other web developers. Um, they tend to not care so much about the details of the methods, but they care a lot about accessing the data. They're very interested in APIs, in um, things that make their jobs easy. All of these things, just going through and recognizing that you have all these different users and that they have very different needs for your data is about, allows you to start to think about how to get actually open, actually usable data. I'm talking about you doing a lot of work. And I think that you should do this work because it will get you a better bit of open data and it will get you better science. But it will also save, your t save you time. Just as in um, code, a lack of documentation means answering basic questions forever. Um, if you don't spell out your methods, if you don't spell out the way that you've collected data, people will email you. And you will have to respond to every single one of them. Um, don't do that. Testing your results is obvious, but it needs to be done. As I talked about the statistical methods sheets, completely rewrote them. Because even with all of this, I'd misjudged my audience. And when I'd rewritten them, we went back and we retested because you need to do that. Um, you need to find people who don't understand your area and you need to talk to them. And if you can get them to agree, quiz them at the end of it. Say, OK, what was I doing here? Because if they can't answer you, they didn't get it.
I see a lot of people talking about APIs. I love APIs. Um, it's absolutely something you should have. I think, though, when I, when I come to Linux Comp, when I talk to audiences like this, there's a lack of recognition of how far behind even good and technical scientists are. Um, please often offer prepackaged CSV downloads. Um, there's a lot of people who can work with that who are really uncomfortable with anything further up. Open data is only useful if it's used. This is the one thing that I want to come back to and come back to and come back to. Um, I love science. I love doing science. I love working with scientists. But if you make something opaque and you make something complex, we lose the ability to have that work done because there just isn't communication. And I've talked there about scientists, but absolutely, you know, I want better data journalism in this country, and we're going to see that through making data accessible to non-technical users and making the ways that that data is collected accessible to people who don't know much about how you collected that data or why you collected that data. Um, we use personas, they're not the only tool, but they're a good tool. They get you to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and use documentation. I feel like this is all a really obvious list, but this is a list that I didn't have a year ago. Um, and so I'm hoping that there's someone here who's thinking about producing and sharing or is producing and sharing open data. And I'm hoping that you're realizing that there might be holes, that there are methods in your area that you're, that you're assuming your users know when they don't. Um, and I'm hoping you'll check, because it might not even be the methods that you think your users don't understand, which are those methods that they actually don't understand. And I recognize that I'm running early, but... Yep. Questions? Thank you. Uh, you said about producing right data. If we take your example, like wine speed, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how you obtained wine speed, like if you obtain it from something like Pitotube, uh, using the pressure, instant pressure, and you already calculated the wine speed using your hypothesis. Then you clean it up from the peaks. Uh, what we get as an output would be not the wine speed, but your approximation of it. So from my point of view, I would like to see raw pressure data because, well, for example, I can calculate any dissipation from it. So the question is, who decides what data is right and what data is wrong? So I think that's a really important part of working out what you're going to release. And I think that there isn't a right answer around how much cleaning you do. I think it's completely reasonable to do no cleaning in some cases, to just say, this is the raw feed, this is what we got, um, and our users will make the modifications they can. 
in a lot of ways, in that case, you've got the most information um, remaining in your data that you can share. On the other hand, um, where I work with medical data, we are never going to release hospital records. We don't, we can't morally, we can't legally, we're just not going to. So in that work, we have to make a lot of choices about which cases we consider in and which cases we consider out um, and how we put that together. Um, I think also, if you're releasing the raw data, then tell people it's raw and point them to papers, point them to resources about what they should be doing with it, what are some of the common ways to do that. Um, because that means that more people can look at wind speed than if you're restricting your data um, to only the people who have that knowledge about how it's collected um, and how you might process it. Yes, but the problem is if you provide this data which is not raw, you actually provide the confirmation of your hypothesis. If any fact is not fit in your hypothesis, you can just get rid of it. And that means that reproducibility would be very good for your hypothesis. But if I have other hypothesis, another one which is not agree with your hypothesis, I wouldn't be able actually to use your data unless you provide the raw data. Any other questions? So um, after watching the, like, in comparison with the bioinformatics talks um, yesterday, um, like in regards to sort of non-technical users uh, or like non-programmers, they're putting a lot of effort into trying to, you know, educate these these guys into actually, you know, getting really into it. Do you think that's too large of a goal in general for open data or like the target audience is too large or do you think there really should be more effort in trying to educate sort of scientists and trying to... <laughs> I mean, we all know burnout is a thing and I recognise that for a lot of the people I'm talking to, I'm asking volunteers to do more work. Um, you absolutely get to decide um, how much effort you want to put into this and whether you want to say, no, look, the barrier to entry is that you've studied this at university or have a competence at that level. Um, having said that, I think that there are people who would love journalists and high school students and scientists who don't have a lot of programming experience to use their data. I think that what I'm talking about is if you are in that group, these are the kind of things that you can do to make it accessible to that wider audience. I mean, I guess another thing between, me, between the stuff I'm doing, which um, we tend to be for, uh, producing data by local government area or by, or by age group, but by these um, cuts so that you get fairly large groups. When you do that, um, you get very small data sets, so you don't, um, bioinformatics has an implicit barrier to entry that you can work out how to deal with gigabytes of data um, which ours doesn't have, and journalists will pick up our stuff and run with it. I'd rather that they published stuff that was that made sense, that reflected reality, rather than because I didn't tell them something that they needed to know, they make the wrong call. Cool. Um, that's all we've got time for. Thanks, Ruben.